Hey everybody, what's going on? I am Greg Sussman, joined today by Jim Sonis of FanDuel, who's here to finally talk about some football. What's happening, Jim? I'm excited, Greg, because it's like mid-August already and I've barely talked any NFL, so it feels a little weird, but it feels right. So I'm ready to dive on in and talk about uh, some mid-range guys with upside. Quite honestly, I have a draft this weekend, so I need all the help that I can get. I talked to you a little bit about it on Friday, and now I need to go full on into it right now. So let's talk about some of these mid-round players that you can get that have a little bit of upside. It's exactly what you're looking for. These are the kind of guys that a lot of people refer to as league winners. So let's go over them. We'll begin with Kareem Hunt of the Cleveland Browns, who right now has an ADP around 56 and a half. So you're getting him much later than you're getting Nick Chubb. And I was just saying before we started that I feel like Kareem Hunt's all the rage right now and Nick Chubb's kind of falling a little bit. Are you one of these Kareem Hunt truthers or do you believe that they can coexist, both Hunt and Chubb, in Cleveland? I think they can coexist mostly because we saw them coexist last year. And the problem is that it didn't go well for Nick Chubb and it went pretty well for Kareem Hunt, especially, especially relative to cost. Because if we look at just those eight games, in those eight games, Kareem Hunt, 5.4 carries per game, but also 5.5 targets per game. We talked a lot about this, Greg, about the value of targets in a half PPR scoring setting because a target is worth twice as much as a carry. So even though Kareem Hunt getting like, you know, 10 or so opportunities per game, he's still at double digit half PPR points in five of those eight games. And he had at least five points in every single game. So what you're getting out of Kareem Hunt is a player who has a weekly floor and an overall season long floor as well. But there's also a path to a bigger ceiling, which we don't usually get for guys in this mid-round. Because, like, if Kareem Hunt gets additional carries on early downs, that could give him a ceiling. Or if something were to happen to Nick Chubb, it's a weird season. You know, something could always happen for sure. That could give Kareem Hunt this bell cow type workload. And in this offense, that'd probably be pretty sweet. So I think that those that's one path upside. The other one is that there's been some discussion around using Kareem Hunt as the Browns' number three wide receiver at times. That would be really enticing, getting both him and Chubb on the field at the same time. So multiple paths to a ceiling for Kareem Hunt that is included with that floor as well. So, you know, in the middle of the fifth round, you're not going to find a lot of guys who have both a floor and a path to upside. Kareem Hunt actually has two paths to upside. So I think even though he is all the rage right now, he is a pretty popular name, he's still someone who I think is undervalued. So if we get the same, the same usage as last year, sweet, I'll take it. If we get something even better, he could be a guy, like you said, who could have a league winning type upside. I want that every time I can get it in the fifth round. And Kareem Hunt gets me exactly that. I hear you. And that's what everyone else is talking about, Jim, right? What Kareem Hunt did at the end of last year, how frustrating it was that Nick Chubb didn't play on third downs, that Nick Chubb was really failing at the goal line. So they kept giving the ball to Kareem Hunt. But I do want to throw this back at you because... It's a new coaching staff. The failures of Freddie Kitchen are gone. And you bring in a different coach who certainly has had success running the football in Minnesota. And you wonder if he has the same opinions that Freddie Kitchens did, which makes me wonder about the value of Kareem Hunt and the split playing time between Hunt and Nick Chubb. Yeah, I think that's definitely a concern. But the flip way to view Kevin Stefanski is a guy who is willing to use his best players. And we saw that with Irv Smith last year, where the Vikings, when they realized that they had a legit talent in both their tight ends, decided to go with more two tight end sets. What if they do the same thing with Kareem Hunt, using him as either a wide receiver? I mean, they used Kareem Hunt as a fullback at times last year. I could see a similar situation happening this year. So I think that you could view it that way. But the other way to view it is that we could get Kareem Hunt in unique usage and potential potentially at an even higher snap rate this year. And I think that that's what's enticing to me. So there are some potential passive fillers, maybe the, the floor not as good on Kareem Hunt as perceived, but I think with those upsides being there, I will still take even a slightly decreased floor just because those upsides are so sweet. Of course, league winning upside here in the middle rounds for Kareem Hunt, that ceiling is high enough that he can win it all for you. Draft Kareem Hunt on draft day. Moving on to the wide receivers here, Jim. I get to Marquise Brown, another incredibly popular name uh, among everybody, right? Like Kareem Hunt and Hollywood Brown are two of the most popular sleepers, if you will, that you could draft in the middle rounds because everyone saw the upside for both of these guys last year. And Hollywood Brown it started at the beginning. He started in that first game. And now he's completely healthy and he's gained some weight and he knows the rigors of the NFL season. Everybody's in on Hollywood Brown. And yet his ADP hasn't risen, I think, as much as many people expected. What is, I guess the floor for Marquise Brown. 
I think that the floor is similar to what we saw last year where he has these pop games, but also has a lot of disappointing games. And I think that that is definitely a risk with Hollywood Brown. So if we're comparing him to Kareem Hunt, I think that the floor is lower on Marquise Brown than on Kareem Hunt. But there were a lot of things working against Marquise Brown last year. You mentioned the injuries. That was one thing. There was also game flow because the Ravens were up like 41 nothing at halftime on a good number of teams. When that happens, you're not going to use a guy who is banged up. You're not going to use a guy uh, who's had these injuries. You're not going to throw the ball at all. So those were a couple of things working against Marquise Brown in addition to the fact that he was a rookie learning the ropes in the NFL. But now... No longer a rookie. You're hoping, at least, that the injuries will not be there. Those are two things that could swing towards his favor this year. I'm not expecting the game flow to totally be in his favor, but it might be better than it was last year if the Ravens play a more competitive game. So potentially two of three or maybe even three of three things that are working against him may not work against him last year. Remember, last year, Marquise Brown played at least 70% of the snaps in just four games across the entire season. He still had uh, 20% of the targets and the games that he did play. So still, even when we don't take out the games where his snap rate was super low, he still got a healthy number of targets. A lot of those were downfield. And I think the biggest indicator of what we could see out of Marquise Brown this year came in their playoff game because they took the reins off. He was healthy for that game. And Marquise Brown went nuts. 11 targets, 126 yards. And I think that, you know, we're not going to expect to see that every game this year, but if we get the leash taken off, there is the potential for him to have those pop games that he had more regularly than he did. Maybe we'll still see the, the down games where the Ravens get up big early and he's not involved in that time. But if we can get more pop games, you can definitely take that downside as well. So I think that the floor here, definitely, you know, there are some concerns if, if, if things repeat themselves, if he gets hurt again, stuff like that. But the upsides, if he's healthy, and if they pass a bit more, are really fun. We're taking A.J. Brown at pick 42, but Hollywood Brown's going to pick 64. I think they have pretty similar concerns. So if I'm going to take a risk on someone with some volume concerns, give me Hollywood 20 picks later with similar upside. Two players in A.J. Brown and Marquise Brown that have the ability to just go off at any moment. But the ADP says Marquise Brown's going 20 picks later, as Jim just described. I will also take that upside 20 picks later. The value is clearly there. The pop games are also going to be there. It's just that consistency that we have to question. But at this price, is well worth selecting on draft day. One final player to mention, and this is the one I'm almost most intrigued to talk to you about because no one's talking about Christian Kirk. We get it. DeAndre Hopkins is with Arizona now. Larry Fitzgerald is a Hall of Famer. And then you have Christian Kirk, who I think if DeAndre Hopkins wasn't in Arizona— well, we be talking about Kirk just like we're talking about Hollywood Brown. Instead, Hawkins is there. And Fitzgerald's role is solidified. Sure, Kyler Murray's like, yeah, we're going to have three 1,000-yard receivers this year. But it's a lot easier said than done. I will mention that we have a lot of fantasy insiders describing that DeAndre Hopkins' targets are going to go down, which could mean, well, Christian Kirk's targets go down also because Hawkins is now in play. A lot of question marks surrounding this Arizona offense and the wide receiver position, specifically Christian Kirk, who right now is going at pick 88. Yeah, I think, Greg, a lot of times we think we know more than we do when it comes to these situations. Christian Kirk going at pick 88 kind of assumes that his target share will go down a lot from where it was last year. And that could very well happen. Like, there's a reason that his cost has gone down. DeAndre Hopkins is really freaking good. And if the Cardinals are smart, they will funnel a lot of targets his way. But Christian Kirk... Also pretty good, too, and I think we can forget how good his usage was when he was healthy last year. In the games that Christian Kirk played, he had 24% of the team's overall targets and 33% of the deep targets. So he's not going to get there this year because DeAndre Hopkins is there, and again, they should go that way. But if we give him 20% of the overall targets and about 30% of the deep targets in an offense that could be high-faced, or high paced, could be efficient, and could throw the ball quite a bit, that's still a lot of juice for pick 88. So, yeah, we could see things happening where Christian Kirk's volume goes down a good amount. Maybe he doesn't get the, the same target share as last year. That's probably going to happen. But, you know, it's also a new offense for DeAndre Hopkins. Christian Kirk is a young player who has performed well in his two seasons in the NFL and is on an offense we want to get exposure to because of the potential that they have with their pace and with their potential for efficiency. So, sure, you can pay the bill on DeAndre Hopkins, Kenyon Drake, or Kyler Murray, but instead you can get exposure to this Cardinals offense by taking Christian Kirk at pick 88. And personally, 
with the, the floor that he has of getting the number two wide receiver in a fast pace, heavy pass offense, I think that's a good floor. And there's the potential for much more if things don't shake out the way we expect them to from a target share perspective. So again, getting a good floor, but also a path to a better ceiling and exposure, cheap exposure to a good offense. I'll take that every day. So Christian Kirk, I think where he's going is kind of a no brainer target for me. You do this a lot in DFS, right? Specifically baseball, which we've been talking about, where you'll go to Coors Field and you'll just take the cheapest option, right? Rather than necessarily paying up for a Trevor Story or a Nolan Arenado, instead, you, you get somebody cheaper that just happens to be there. A like Cole Calhoun of Arizona is there, for instance. That's what we've talked about recently. For Christian Kirk, it's the same type of model. You don't have to pay up for DeAndre Hopkins or Kenny and Drake or Kyler Murray, guys that are going in the first three, four rounds of your draft. Instead, you wait to pick 88 and you get a Christian Kirk who certainly showed the ability last year to be a big-time fantasy contributor. And now he costs you less than we ever imagined, and I think those big-time fantasy contributions are still on the table. That's the type of player you're getting with Christian Kirk. There's a lot of question marks around Arizona, but what we do know is you want a piece of that offense. Christian Kirk is the cheapest way to do it. Let's draft Kirk on draft day. There you have it, Jim. Those are the three middle-round guys that, well, they could— really pay off and give you big dividends on draft day. We appreciate the time. Good luck in your drafts. Thank you, Greg. Good luck to you in your draft as well. I'm looking forward to talking more NFL with you in the very near future. Absolutely. It is going to be a ton of fun. I'm learning every day. I'm adjusting the rankings constantly. As soon as we hang up, Christian Kirk going up just for the record. We appreciate the time. For Jim Astonis, I am Greg Sussman. Thanks so much for watching. Good luck, everybody. And we'll see you tomorrow for another edition of the FanDuel Hurry Up.